Good evening. It's time to begin our evening worship service at Oaks West. We'd like to welcome everyone back this evening, especially those that are visiting with us and those on the live stream. Our next scheduled service will be Wednesday evening, and uh, Daryl was handing out uh, folders. We'll begin Revelations. So if you did not get a folder for the Revelation class Wednesday evening, there are dark blue folders in the foyer on the table. Uh, be sure and pick one of those up. Uh, the rest uh, failed to mention this morning, Arlene uh, Johnson wasn't feeling well, and uh, she's uh, still under the weather this evening, and Jim uh, stayed home with her. Glad to see Mike McMurray back this morning. He was uh, out of town taking care of some business this morning. Brother Jim Turner will lead us in our song service. At the proper time, Brother Randall Vanneman will lead us in our first prayer. Brother Darrell will bring us another lesson, and at the close of the service, Brother Robert Moore will have the uh, Lord's Supper and the closing prayer. The Hebrew writer in chapter 12, in verse 28, said, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Brother Jim. Three hundred ninety one. He keeps me singing. We'll sing all three verses. Three hundred ninety one. Show me there's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Here I am with thee. Peace be still. In all of myself that Oh, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go, feasting on the riches of His grace. Resting beneath the sheltering wind, always looking on His smiling face. That is why I shout and sing, Jesus, 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 sweetest name. Singing as I go, soon he's coming back to welcome me. Far beyond the starry sky, I shall wait my flight to worlds unknown. I shall wait with him on high. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Number 599, more holiness give me. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. After the singing of the song will be led in prayer. 599. <laughs> Show me more holiness give me more striving
Let's all pray together, please. Our most gracious, merciful, loving Heavenly Father, you are the only true and living God. Not only are you our God, but you are our Father. And we're very thankful. For your love has given us the way to salvation through your Son and our Savior, as he willingly went to a cross and died because of and for our sin. And yes, Father, you know we're sinners. We are striving each day to do better, but we do fail each and every day. Give us the strength we need to resist the temptations we're faced with each day. We might grow to be your children in all things, glorifying your name, honoring you for all that you have done. And Father, we are thankful that we have the hope of life everlasting with you. Help us, Father, to live our lives according to your will in all things. That as Elaine once said, she is ready. She wants to go home. We're thankful that you have her now and she is home. Father, we all want to live our lives according to that glorious attitude that one day we'll get home. We'll be able to share the fellowship and worship to you each and every minute hour and day for eternity. We pray for Lyndon. We pray for Jack. We pray for Jerry and Nancy. We pray for Carrie Burns and all those of the household of faith who need your providence. And Father, we pray as we live our lives, you will watch over us, guide us, guard us, and direct us, and give us the hope that you have promised. And you've never failed any promises. You've always kept your promises. Help us to remember that we have a responsibility as Christians, not only to live our lives according to your will, but to help someone else to find the way to the truth of the gospel of our Savior, your Son. And it's in His name we pray. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Sing number 466. I know whom I have believed. If you're able to stand for the singing of the song, please do. 466. me so I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed before his own but I know who I have Persuaded that he is able to 
Please take out your Bibles and turn to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. We've been studying joy once a month for many months now. And we have been facing the question, how do we keep going? How can we rejoice in the Lord always on an ongoing basis? Put simply... We have to learn how to overcome some of the things that we find ourselves mired in today. And it's not different today than it's always been for man. But life produces a certain amount of fear, doubt, and discouragement. Now we've talked about fear in this series before, but tonight we're going to talk about it a little bit differently When we think about our lives, there's certain things we look forward to and certain things we don't. For example, I'm not looking forward to tomorrow. Anybody that's paying any taxes knows what tomorrow is. Kind of a day we don't enjoy each year in which we have to write a check to the government and hand some of that over. So as the year comes on, you know, you start the new year, you're happy with that. And I kind of see that day approaching, and I think about it from time to time. That's not something I look and look forward to. But at the same time, I've got a grandbaby on the way, and I'm really looking forward to that. So life presents itself with challenges in highs and in lows. And a lot of times, if we put too much stock, too much faith, too much value in this world, then we get let down. Kind of like an air balloon that you fill up and it just gets popped. You see, joy doesn't come by pleasing people. Joy doesn't come from pleasure in this world. Certainly doesn't come from sin. Doesn't come from knowledge or power or possessions. It will come if someone will turn to the Lord. That's where lasting and real joy is. It will come when we want to grow spiritually in that relationship with the Lord. It will come if we live every day with the expectation of the Lord's return for us. But maybe you would simply like to have joy that comes from better circumstances, whatever that circumstance might be for you. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's in the proper perspective. We see tragedies happen around us on a regular basis, both in this country and around the world. And so really, as we grow older, maybe we get a little bit jaded in it because we realize that a lot of times there are some good things that happen in the future, but sometimes it's just sorrow and despair as well. But in reality... A disciple of Christ ought to be the best equipped person in the world for dealing with what may come in the future. And when we think about the future, there's always an element of fear of what next year or next decade might bring or the next phase of our life might bring. When Adam sinned, he said to God, I was afraid, so I hid myself. Adam was afraid of the future because he had sinned. He had broken the law of God, and he really had no other reason to fear other than that. 
And as long as we are in this world, we're going to have to face fear because sin abounds. Not just in our lives, but the lives of the people around us. We work to eliminate temptation. We work to resist sinning. But there's a lot of the world that doesn't have those same constraints. And that causes a lot of suffering. But we can't escape those fears. We just can't do it by ourselves. We can't do it alone. And so there's really three characteristics to fear. There is that uncertainty about the future. There is guilt about the past. And then there's a feeling of inadequacy in the present. That particular one some have named the Goliath syndrome. Feeling inadequate to deal with whatever's facing them in the moment. But David had some helpful things to say about how he overcame fear, and I think that'll help us tonight. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. So these first three verses here give us three reasons for David's confidence in the Lord. And we will read the rest of that psalm, so you might keep a marker there. But let's first of all talk about this confidence. Confidence is freedom from doubt. Some people say, well, it's a believing in yourself, and it's a believing in your abilities. But that's not the limit of confidence. Confidence also is a feeling of trust in someone. David trusted the Lord. It is a state of hopefulness even out of that trust. He had this trustful relationship with the Lord so much so that he was assured, he was confident that God would do what he promised to do for David. And so that's why in all the things that David faced, for the most part, he was free from fear and he had hope about his future. David's confidence in the Lord set the stage for joy in the Lord, giving him a constant source of rejoicing, which is what we are looking for, to be able to rejoice in the Lord always. So David was confident in the Lord because of who the Lord is. He said, the Lord is my light. Light is a metaphor. It is a symbol for everything that is helpful to man. It can be truth. It can be goodness. It can be gladness. It can be life. It's used in the Psalms, in Isaiah, and in even in the New Testament as well. And I can see David facing these situations where people might look at him and say, well, his back's against the wall. It's all over for him. There's no way out for him. But David saw a clear way out of those situations. But it was only a way out for the righteous individual that trusted in the Lord. Jesus today, he is our light. He can push away the doubt and the uncertainty that creates fear in our lives. His words dispel the darkness and show us a clear way out of distress. He has said He will never leave us, and He will never forsake us. Now Psalm 107 is another good psalm, though it's a bit longer, and I'm not going to try to read it for you tonight, but you might go home and put that in your reading plan for this week. It's a psalm of thanksgiving to the Lord for great works of deliverance for Israel. Five times in that psalm, the psalmist repeats these words, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them out of their distresses. A simple solution was, cry out to the Lord. Why? Because He listens. Because He is there. And not only does He listen, but He answers. They were then delivered because they saw the light. The Lord was their light, and when they repented and turned to Him, He delivered them. But David also said that the Lord was his salvation. He understood a need for salvation from sin, not just enemies. And what's unique about David is he's, he's writing as a king, but he's writing as a servant of God. And so sometimes he's talking about the nation, and sometimes he's talking about the enemies that he might have as a king or as a nation. 
and sometimes he's facing very personal issues. But the salvation that David sought was not just from those enemies and not just from those circumstances, but it was that ultimate salvation that came only from the Lord. In Psalm 32 and verse 5, Psalm 32 and verse 5, he says, I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in a rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. David had complete confidence in the Lord as a rescuer, yes, in those moments of distress, but ultimately as salvation for his soul. And there's an application we can make from that. If you'll turn to the New Testament to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll start with verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul said, you were dead in the trespasses and the sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. There is none of us that does not need the salvation of our souls. For all of us can say we were dead in the trespasses and the sins in which we once walked. That we once followed the course of this world. But we have been rescued. We have been saved. That is only through Christ Himself. Stay there in Ephesians because we're going to read another section there in a moment. But David also indicates that the Lord was His strength. And as great a leader as David was, he saw that he was inadequate. He could not be the king that he needed to be without the Lord. He could not be the man that he needed to be without the Lord. And I would submit to you that we would all agree with that for ourselves. We cannot be who we need to be without the Lord. We need His strength and we need His help. There in Ephesians in chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. We don't have to do it alone. We don't need to do it alone. We need the Lord. We need his strength. We need what he reveals to us so that it might guide our lives. And so thinking back to those first three verses in Psalm 27, I'm going to break it down this way. Verse 1, David leaves no opening for fear. Again, verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When we are on the Lord's side, there is no one that can take us. There is no one that can steal us. We are secure in the stronghold of the Lord. But in verse 2, he also expresses that confidence because of what the Lord had done. He says, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. David had seen the Lord at work in his life over and over and over. And I don't think you'd have to look very far 
for those that serve the Lord here tonight, for you to see that the Lord has been at work in your life. He has given us opportunities. He has given us advantages. He has given us strength and help. I truly do not want to think of what my life would be without the Lord. I don't think David did either. David had a good memory when it came to what God had done for him. And we need but open the scriptures and see God working in David's life. The promises that were made to him that were fulfilled. And now for us, the promise that God will work in our lives. And so verse 2 also shuts the door on fear for David. And David was confident in the Lord because of what he will do. Verse 3, though an enemy encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, yet I will be confident. David wasn't being overconfident. He was just certain of the outcome because he was seeking to do the will of the Lord. And we're not facing the same situations. None of us is the king of a people. None of us is in that situation in which we make life and death decisions that may result in adversaries that may fight against us, but yet we are fighting for our souls. We are engaged in a spiritual battle, and the Lord has revealed to us that all those that are on His side are victorious. We know how it ends. We often thank the Father for what He has done for us through Christ. But how often do we express a confidence in what He will continue to do to help us? And perhaps if we make that a habit, then we will rejoice in the Lord always. But let's finish Psalm 27, beginning in verse 4. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For He will hide me in His shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in the, his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. While all of this psalm has value, I want to focus for the rest of this on just verses 4 through 6. Because there's something that David teaches us. He teaches us to truly seek the Lord. He's already talked about it being a stronghold. He's already talked about his confidence. But he says, I will seek after the Lord. And he even prays about that. You would think, just logically, that seeking after the Lord is something that I do. But David is indicating that it's something that the Lord helps us even to do. He says, one thing I have asked of the Lord, that I will seek after Him, but that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. How does that present itself? Well, I think that David was seeking guidance. And he wanted that guidance to bring him to the Lord. He wanted that guidance to always lay out a path for him that kept him in line with the Lord's will, that kept him protected by the Lord, and that he would be able to hide in his shelter when those troubles did come. But understand that if we are not seeking the Lord all the time, then when those troublesome times do come, we find ourselves without shelter. We find ourselves without the stronghold of the Lord. And so David sought not only to do the will of the Lord, not only to have the guidance of the Lord, but to seek 
the presence of the Lord. He was consumed with this desire to be in God's presence, even when he was on the run from Saul, even when he couldn't be near the tabernacle, when he was struggling with any sort of fear or doubt or discouragement, he always turned to the Lord and those things were dispelled. They were driven away from him. The worst thing that we can do is to walk away from the Lord and find ourselves alone. We need to be seeking His presence as well as His guidance. To dwell in His house is the way that David would describe it. But today, we have the church. The body of Jesus. We have each other. And we have the Lord with us. And he's always talking about the beauty and the majesty of the Lord. And we need to see that as well. And we need to inquire of Him. These things will help us to have the presence of the Lord in our lives. And we need to seek that protection that the Lord offers. David sought the presence of the Lord knowing that His presence brought protection. When fear creeps in because of a time of trouble, we too need to seek protection in God's pavilion and as David would say, his tabernacle, but for us, the church even. We need to let him set us high upon a rock, that is to lift us up. Now David doesn't usually put much emphasis on the cause of any fear or uncertainty that he faced. But rather, he expressed his faith in the one who would protect him from those things that created fear. We can't get rid of all the things in this world that might create fear for us. But we can have the Lord in our life in such a way that it dispels the fear that we might find. And so we seek the presence and the protection of the Lord so that fear will never be a dominant factor in our lives and it will never impair our spiritual vision nor impede our walk. I will submit to you that when we allow fear to run rampant in our lives, we find ourselves very quickly derailed. We don't make good decisions. and We don't keep our eyes on the Lord. We need to let the Lord dispel those fears. But really, verses 7 through 12 there, he's, he's just praying to the Lord. Hear me when I cry. Be gracious. Answer me. Your face do I seek. Don't hide it from me. These are the things that David expresses because he reaches out to the Lord in prayer. Brother Robert talked about it in class this morning of Nehemiah praying for such a long period of time before he ever acted on anything regarding the news he heard about Jerusalem. We talked two weeks ago about prayer in our class then. Prayer is our lifeline. It is vital to our spiritual lives that we can reach out to God and communicate with Him. Sometimes I just need to lay things at His feet and just let Him have them. Because there are things that are beyond my control. There are things that are beyond my power, but nothing is beyond the power of the Lord. I can trust Him in these things. And so our prayers need to deal with our fears as well. We need to be seeking the presence of the Lord. But even after this, David didn't, didn't just talk about God. He's talking to God. He's not just telling everybody else, I have confidence in the Lord. He is letting us have this glimpse into his personal relationship with God that we see him talking to God. And so even though he expresses his confidence in the Lord, he needed that constant infusion, if you will. He needed that, that conversation with God. He overcomes the feeling of uncertainty by simply saying, teach me. Teach me your way. Oh, many times we will talk about, well, if, if it's the Lord's will, or we will say we will pray according to the Lord's will. But we also need to know the Lord's will. 
ask him to teach us and show us the way of his will. So it's as if David is holding out his hand to God and God is taking his hand and David is saying, I need you. Don't leave me. Tell me again. Tell me again what I need to do. David is described as a man after God's own heart. And you would think somebody with that description already knew what the Lord's will was. But here in Psalm 27, he's revealing that he prays again and again, teach me your way. Show me your will. No matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how many years you've been faithful, you still need the Lord to show you his will. You need to ask for it. You need to look for it. You need to pray for it. Even Jesus offered prayers that were similar to what David is, does when he was in the garden. And he had that statement, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. We need to adopt the same attitude. Your will be done. Let, let me see it. Let me see what I'm supposed to do. Let me see what your will is so that I may follow it. So that I may set aside what I want or what I desire and fully follow your will. To overcome his fears, David was placing his confidence in the Lord, seeking the Lord, praying to the Lord. And then finally at the end, he says, wait for the Lord. Out of all the things we've mentioned, this one might be difficult for you. It might be difficult for you to wait for the Lord. Just because David had confidence in the Lord. Just because David was seeking the Lord. Just because David was praying to the Lord, that didn't make the situation causing his fear just disappear to no longer be an issue for him. He had to wait to once again see the goodness of the Lord. Fears exist in this life because of sin, but the goodness of God is always triumphing. Let me share with you a couple more verses. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. And read with me beginning in verse 1. Isaiah chapter 43, beginning in verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. That little glimpse into the relationship that God can have with His people when He says... I have redeemed you. There is no need for fear. Know who I am. Know what I would give for you. And what did he give? He gave his only begotten son for us. To release us from the bondage and the condemnation of sin. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 11, He said, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? God wants to give us good things. He wants that relationship. He wants to be our God, our protector, our redeemer. James said in chapter 1, verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Every good gift comes from God. Let the goodness of God dispel the fears of this world. David knew that those fears that he faced, whatever the, the particular circumstance of any given moment was, that these things would pass and that the goodness of the Lord 
would be what remains. Fear is something that can easily master us. But David shows us how to overcome it. And when we do, then we can truly rejoice in the Lord always. I will leave you with one final verse, one we've read before in this series. John chapter 14, verse 1. John 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. I'll admit that I have trouble wrapping my mind around that. Being in heaven with God. Being in His presence and what that's going to be like. He tries to open our minds to see glimpses of it when He gives it description in some worldly terms, but I don't believe that holds a candle to it. Heaven is going to be worth it. Heaven is going to be worth every trial that we face, every moment of endurance that we must exercise. Heaven will surely be worth it all. The lesson is yours this evening. If you realize that there is some spiritual need in your life and you'd like the assistance of your brethren in those things, we'd like to offer our assistance. That's what we're here for. The Lord tells us how much we should rely on one another. Even going so far as to confess our sins to one another. That we might be able to help to bear that load. We might help to restore such a one. And then we might do so with a spirit of gentleness and of love. So song number 835 has been selected as an invitation song. If you have need, won't you please come to the front while we stand and sing. If you'll take out your song books and turn to number six. Song number six. Number six. The Lord is my light and my salvation.
Lord's table is prepared for any this morning, any that are here this evening that weren't, uh, weren't able to partake this morning. Would you raise your hand if you need to at this time? Okay, Brother Mike. Our Holy Father, we come before thee at this time thankful for every blessing and thankful for this bread, which to Christians represents the body of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue our thanks unto thee, Holy Father, for this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that Jesus shed, the life that he gave on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand for the closing prayer? Our Holy Father, we come before thee at the close of this service, the close of this another Lord's Day. We thank you, Holy Father, for the blessings connected to the worship of the day, for the many reminders regarding your love for us and for the way that has been provided in Jesus. As we begin a new week, Holy Father, as we go our separate ways and live our various lives, we need your help. We pray, Holy Father, that we would be diligent in living our days one at a time. That we would keep our focus upon the life to come. That we would make it our aim to be more like Jesus every day. To be an encouragement to those that we're with often. To let our light shine before those who are lost in a dark world. We pray your blessings, especially upon those who will have the difficulty of the week as it relates to the loss of Sister Elaine. We pray that they would be comforted by each other, by their brethren who love them and love her and by people in general. We love you, Holy Father. It is evident that you love us, that your Son loves us, that the Spirit loves us, that the Spirit loves us, and we're so grateful for the holy angels who minister to us according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> 